Hey folks, welcome back to the session on cardiopulmonary resuscitation and we are going to start with advanced cardiovascular life support. So let's begin with the question. Identify the maneuver given below for airway management. So that's the picture and you have lot of picture questions coming in on your way in the exams. So the options are head tilt and chin lift, manual inline stabilization, jaw thrust and head extension. So you can see here that there is head tilt, the person is tilting the head and lifting the jaw. So this is the head tilt and the chin lift maneuver. Let's go back and read a little theory of advanced cardiovascular life support. So it has two assessments, primary assessment and secondary assessment. The primary assessment again has A, B, C, D. This is for your remembrance. A stands again for airway, B for breathing, C for circulation, D stands for disability and E is for exposure. When we come to airway, there are two maneuvers that we need to know in the airway. That is the head tilt and the chin lift maneuver and the jaw thrust maneuver. So when we have a situation, we have a victim who is in cardiac arrest, this patient has hypotonia. So because of hypotonia, the tongue falls back, the tongue falls back and it obstructs the airway. And when tongue obstructs the airway, the victim cannot breathe. We have to open the airway using the head tilt and the chin lift maneuver. Now this maneuver is contraindicated. It is contraindicated in patients with cervical spine injury. This is because when we do a head tilt and a chin lift maneuver, we can aggravate the cervical spine injury. So, any patient who has multiple traumas, multiple traumas on the chest, on the head and on the neck, we have to assume that this victim has got a cervical spine injury and we will not use a head tilt chin lift maneuver in such a victim. That for a victim with cervical spine injury or multiple fractures, we have to use jaw thrust to open the airway. When we open the airway, we must assess the airway for any foreign body that might also be there in the airway and obstructing the airway of the victim and leading to cardiac arrest. Next is breathing. So, as I said, breathing, we have to deliver about 12 to 15 breaths per minute. In ACLS, we can deliver this breaths by using any advanced gadgets like an endotracheal tube. Now, this is the gold standard when we are using an endotracheal tube. When we are using an endotracheal tube, we can give breaths that is 10 to 12 breaths asynchronous of the chest compressions. That is, the chest compressions can go on at a rhythm of 100 to 120 asynchronously with the breaths and the other person can ventilate the chest using an endotracheal tube at this rate. We can also use a supraglottic airway device. Supraglottic airway devices are the devices again which are very easy to insert. They do not require expertise like, like which is required for uh, inserting an endotracheal tube and you can maintain the oxygenation and ventilation of the victim using these devices. But this device does not prevent aspiration. So we have to interrupt with the chest compressions when we are using a supraglottic device. C stands for circulation and we must remember what I have already spoken about the effective chest compressions that is push hard, push fast, allow complete recoil and minimal interruptions in the chest compression. D stands for disability. So if we have a victim and we have gone given ABC and the victim has a return of spontaneous circulation, victim revives, we must assess this victim for any disability. The neurological integrity we must assess. Is there any hypoxic damage to the brain as a result of CPR or as a result of anoxia, hypoxia, we must assess this victim. E stands for 
exposure that is we must expose the victim completely and must look for any obvious bruises injuries any medication alert any bleeding any fractures so this will give us some insight to the cause of cardiac arrest this was primary assessment the secondary assessment specially focus on an inquiry to the etiology of cardiac arrest so the mnemonic is sample we must take extensive history from the relatives and we must look examine the patient look for any bleeding and bruises as i said ask for any history of allergies maybe the patient has ingested some medication which he was allergic to we must inquire about any medications that the patient was taking maybe antiplatelet drugs or anticoagulants also must know about the last meal time of the victim because if the patient is full stomach he might aspirate and any other events that have occurred recently maybe an angioplasty maybe an angiography or any recent surgery for that matter secondary assessment is as i said is aimed at knowing the etiology of the cardiac arrest so the 5 h's and 5 t's are the road maps to know the next intervention and the diagnosis of cardiac arrest so these are the reversible causes of cardiac arrest h is stands for any hypovolemia any hypoxia any hypo or hyperkalemia h i n concentration and hypothermia now this is again copy to hippocampus you must remember this by heart any thrombosis that is any pulmonary thrombosis or a myocardial infarction that is cardiac thrombosis tension pneumothorax cardiac tamponade and any toxins all of these are reversible causes of cardiac arrest so as a team leader of the acls team it is our duty to enquire upon these things okay so that brings us to one question a young patient was given regional anesthesia with 0.25% of bupi vacan this looks like more of a regional anesthesia question but no it's not the patient became unresponsive and pulseless the best management for this patient is so now let's read the question again there was a young patient who was given regional anesthesia using this drug the patient became unresponsive and pulseless so when the victim is unresponsive and pulseless that means the victim is in cardiac arrest so what should be the best treatment for such a victim it is cpr right but there is another thing which has been given to us in the question is 0.25% of bupivacaine which is a local anesthetic let's read our options cpr alone cpr with 20% intralipid infusion so let me tell you here like we read in the next previous slide that's toxins we must have inquire about any toxins so here we have 0.25% bupivacaine which is obviously not toxic but if this drug goes accidentally the intravascular space there is cardiovascular collapse or there could be any arrhythmias or cns toxicity which can be manifested by this drug going into the intravascular space so what is the antidote for this drug it is the 20% intralipid infusion so so much so that uh, our american society of anesthesiologists has given us guidelines saying whenever we are giving any regional block to any patient our anesthesia trolley must have 20% intralipid infusion on the trolley ready in case of an inadvent accidental delivery of huge amount of local anesthetic into a intravascular space so the answer to this question will be cpr with 20% intralipid infusion correct